we're going to relax and uh, we're going to let you in on some trade secrets. <laughs> And we're going to tell you some great stories. Uh, you got to understand, some of them we cannot tell, but many of them we can, and uh, we are a family. I remember, uh, Mark, when um, I got the phone call from Glenn Payne that uh, I thought was Ernie, because Ernie always liked to play tricks on me. Er Ernie knew how much I wanted to sing. He and I went to college together. You got to back up and tell the fun part why I hung you, why it worked in the first place. Well, yeah, you will, because you're mean. <laughs> Ernie knew how much I wanted to sing. He and I went to college together, and he knew I was eat up with this, and this is what I wanted to do, and we sang together in a, in a college group in college. Then Ernie quit college to go sing with uh, Squire Parsons. And then he got a job with the Dixie Melody Boys, and I was thinking, he's already had two jobs with two professional groups, and here I sit, laboring in college. I don't want to be here either. And he has got to help me. He is my in into this. And so I called him on the phone one day. I said, Ernie, surely you can help me get a job singing gospel music, man. You're in it now. You got to please don't forget about your little buddy back here. Please help me. <laughs> And so I was in college uh, a few months later, and um, I went home for the weekend, and when I was home one Saturday morning, my telephone rang, and I answered the phone, and this is what I heard. Is this Scott Fowler? I said, yes, it is. And this voice said, Scott, uh, this is Eldritch Fox with the Kingsman Quartet, and Ernie Haas has told me that you'd like to have a job singing gospel music and I think we could use you. Would you consider singing with the Kingsman Quartet? And before we were off the phone, I had sent a letter to the college telling them I was <laughs> quitting. And after about 10 minutes of this cruel, heartless, heartless. trick, Tricks. I hear him, he starts laughing, and the real boys come, this is Ernie! <laughs> And I said, I hate you. <laughs> so now fast forward, I got an opportunity no, to sing with a group in Houston, Texas called The Sound. Yep. That's and wow. You guys remember them. And I, I was with them about uh, two and a half years when one morning about 8.30, my telephone rang. Now by now, Ernie has made it. He is singing with the cathedrals. And my telephone rang 8.30 one morning. It woke me up because I normally didn't get up till the crack of noon. <laughs> and what I heard that day was, is this Scott Fowler? I said, yes. He said, this is Glenn Payne with the Cathedral Quartet. I said, nice try, Ernie. <laughs> <laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> <laughs> so right off the bat, I had told ah. Glenn Payne, you're a liar. <laughs> this is not... <laughs> That, that's why I want you to sit between us. So, then I got to join the cathedrals, and uh, let, me, let me just tell you this real quick, um, and then we're going to go on to someone else here. Uh, I'll never forget being on stage one night, and the programs with the cathedrals were just great. Hi, Trey. Ladies and gentlemen, that's Trey Ivey. Well, there Hi, Trey. he is. Glad you could join us. That's really neat, because... Until uh, this morning, he didn't realize there were two nine o'clock in the same day. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so I'm finally on stage with the great Cathedral Quartet, and I am just in awe nonstop at George's ability to, to run a program and to call a program and to just make you feel, make the audience feel like you're in his living room and make us feel like we're in the living room with him, and he just was great at it. And uh, one night we got back on the bus, and um, you always knew that you were in trouble when George got quiet. And he would sit back in the couch, and he scratched his hand like this, and he would just stare off into space. And you knew someone was going to get it over something. 
And so we're all just sitting there being real quiet and hoping it's not going to be us. And finally he looks at me and he said, Scott. <laughs> when he laughed, you knew it was going to be good. He said, uh, I know that my jokes on stage bore you. <laughs> but I sure would appreciate it if you wouldn't look at your watch while I'm talking. Nobody look at your watch, all right? Ernie, no doubt you've got a good one here. Yeah, the laugh. Everybody with, that ever known George knows if you get the... Well, if it was somebody else getting in trouble, it yeah. was very funny to the it rest of us. It was very funny. To, yeah. It was usually me. Oh, <laughs> uh, you know what? I see, so where could I start? There's so many, but the thing that tr triggered this story was just talking about your first, you know, cathedral experience. And mine, um, I got on the bus and uh, got to travel with with Mark Trammell, and uh, and he was helping me with my parts and all like that. So I was really excited, real nervous. Our first, my first concert was with. Uh, not just the cathedrals, but it was the Gaither Vocal Band, and it was before the homecoming phenomenon that happened, and it was the T Tennessee Performing Arts Center, is that it? And, and so they're in Nashville, Tennessee, so nervous, and um, so it was, just, it was just one of those emotional weekends, and so at the very end, uh, they told me, the <laughs> George and Glenn told me before the first note, young man, the job is yours to lose. And that's just the professional side of it. You know, if you go out there and do great this weekend, you're going to get, keep the job. And so the thing is, I, uh, I had that kind of pressure on me. So after it was all over with that weekend, George and Glenn were going to fly home. We were in Mobile, Alabama. They were going to fly home. Uh, we had a matinee. And um, I went out with Glenn that morning, and he wrote my deal, whatever that deal was, the pay, the structure, and, and the benefits and like that. We went to Waffle House, and we sat down, and he wrote it on a Waffle House napkin. And he slid it across the table, and he goes, what do you think about that? <laughs> I said, I think I'll take it. Put that in my pocket. <laughs> no questions asked. And so after the concert, they were getting in a taxi cab. And uh, George walked up to me, and he stuffed some $20 bills in my front pocket. And he said, that car of yours is pitiful. Go buy you some new tires. <laughs> and they were bald. They were... And then he got in the cab, and then Glenn came up. He stuffed some $20 bills in my front pocket, not even knowing George did that. Stuffed some $20 bills in my pocket. He goes, this is going to be the ride of your life. You're going you're to excel here. This is a great organization. Here, you know, go get a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and he kept holding the back of my hair and as he was hugging me. He kept going, just a little off the back, just a little off the back. <laughs> <laughs> I joined him in 83, and uh, it, it, I guess everybody could uh, uh, relate to this. Uh, when you joined the cathedrals, it was always in the month of December. Yeah. Anybody that came on board, because that was the only time that they had off. And uh, we'd take off the month of December, and uh, it would just thrill our hearts. Those kids would get to go and go back to North Carolina or wherever we were from and, and spend Christmas with our, our, our family and all. And, and it never failed that... Uh, uh, Glenn or George would walk up to us and, uh, like Ernie said, and, and, and slip some money in our, in our pockets and say, go and enjoy Christmas. And those are the moments I enjoy. And I, but it's something that's kind of funny. I don't know if Mark knows this or not, but when I joined the cathedrals, he said, Funder Burke, I hope you hang around for a long time. He said, because if you look at Mark, he said, it won't be long before we have to help him on and off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that's why I'm back now. We got to help Mark yeah. on and off the stage, but uh, <laughs> there, <laughs> but no, those are the kind of things that George would always do. And uh, you've heard us say this before, and uh, and it's so true. You know, once a cathedral, always a cathedral. Even after I was gone for a while, I mean, you you never lose that feeling inside that uh, you're a part of this family. And you know what? And I think that's what's so important about you folks being here this weekend because you're a part of our family also. And uh, we're, uh, there's nothing can take that away from us because we're so thankful and so grateful that you are with us. 
And say, I'm from the old school, and I just believe in giving roses while you can smell them. And so you're our family, and I just want to say I love you with all my heart. And uh, so <clears throat> y'all hang around, too, so because it won't be long till we'll have to start helping Gerald get on and off the stage. <laughs> Amen. You go, Mark. He said, you're up, Mark. <laughs> Tell him again. Just 10 minutes ago, before we were walking out here, Mark said, Larissa, my wife, uh, told me to go to the bus for something, and I can't remember what it was. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know why know you're here? <laughs> I don't know what it was either, but he was on my bus looking for it. That was a... <laughs> go ahead, Mark. You're up, Mark. Mark. <laughs> Well, now that you mentioned that, I did wake up for a minute. Uh, uh, we were here in the great state of Texas, and George Johnson's brother, we called him Brudge. Uh, George gave him that name many, many years ago. He's in heaven now, but uh, his name is Eugene. But we call, all called him Brudge. Brudge would go with us once in a while. Brudge was older than George. Uh, Brudge is the reason why George joined uh, uh, the paratroopers, 82nd Airborne Division, Brudge did it, and he told George, son, it's just too tough for you. Don't you dare do it. And George went right straight into it. <laughs> Brudge would go with us on occasion. And Brudge is probably the biggest practical joker I have ever been around in my life. Well, where's Fred Privet? I know you're in here somewhere. Our, our driver. Uh, okay, he's in the back. Okay, I see him. Oh, stand up, Fred. Stand up. Fred Privet. Fred. Yeah. Fred Privet stood behind uh, the record table and drove that green bus and the black bus uh, for many, many years. So he can vouch for this story because Fred was there when this happened. Um, we were here in Texas, and I don't remember exactly where we were, but we were singing at a high school auditorium somewhere in East Texas. Grudge was with us, and he and Roger had uh, made it up that they were, going, they were going to let me know just in passing conversation we were somewhere near um, a penitentiary, so that ought to tell you all where we were. I don't remember. Uh, no, it was in Texas. Uh, they have them here, you know. <laughs> they actually use them. But and. In passing, while we were setting up that afternoon, Rudge and Roger Bennett had, had made it up that they were going to just briefly mention that, that someone had escaped from the penitentiary that's close by. And that evening, after the concert was over, it would take me a long time to tell all the story, but let me just say this to you. Uh, Brudge Yance is in heaven looking down right now, and he and George are slapping their knees and laughing out loud because of the reality that when Brudge... Uh, when he went to the bus first, he knew exactly what he was doing. He had, um, he had a convict outfit in his suitcase. <laughs> and all I heard while we were setting up the speakers was, hey, did you hear that there's been a, uh, there's a, <laughs> there's a, there's been a, a jail break over here at the prison, and uh, there are a couple of guys have escaped. They just left it lay. And that's all I heard, and that's all I needed. Concert was over, had a great night, went to the bus. As soon as I walked in the front of the bus, there's this guy in a striped outfit that's pilfering around and some stuff in the middle of the bus. And as soon as I turn the lights on, I see him, and he goes, hey! <laughs> and I run out the front of the bus, and he starts running after me. <laughs> so I run, I'm not kidding you. I ran around the front of the auditorium, back, and, and I thought, he's gone. So I... And I, di I didn't realize, it, 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 you lose all your faculties when strange things like that happen to you. And I didn't realize that I didn't have my key. I had a dime, and I was trying to put a dime back in the keyhole of that bus to get back in the bus. That's hilarious. When the guy 
that I did not know who, who he was. When he quit chasing me, he was going, <laughs> he was tickled to death that he had scared the life out of me. That's awesome. Brudge Yance in heaven, and when I get there, I'll get you. <laughs> That's the night you got saved, wasn't it? That's right. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that was a third or fourth time. Yeah, <laughs> I heard that as a, as as evidenced by some of the things that he said, he actually lost his salvation right. that night. <laughs> but he was hollering, "Help me, Jesus! Help me, Jesus!" I know that. I'm not real sure that's what I was hollering. <laughs> God knows my heart. Amen. Um. They didn't, they didn't tell us, uh, Landon didn't tell us what um, parameters to use in our uh, stories this morning. So I didn't, I mean, are, are we allowed to talk about the, the old men? I mean, and say stuff that they would have said that was funny to us. Like, um, and this is this not making fun. Every one of us on this platform have said things on the platform that we don't realize we've said later. We say it wrong sometimes, you know, and then nowadays you send emails and tell us what we said wrong. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, and you're very to the point. But anyway, um, back, back, you know, when we, when we were with the cathedrals, there was no email, so a lot of things just went, you know, just went in one ear and out the other. You didn't pay attention. We were in Tulsa, Oklahoma one night at uh, ORU, and um, the tallies were on the program with us, and they did a lot, we did a lot of dates with the tallies back in the 80s. And Lauren Talley was about three years old at yeah. the time, just as cute as she could be, and uh, it was Glenn's birthday. And uh, we were backstage, and right before we walked out on stage, Lauren Talley handed Glenn a homemade birthday card the picture she had drawn. It was just so cute. Well, Glenn was real emotional, and he just cried. It just blessed him, you know. And so we got out on the stage and started our program, and that was on Glenn's mind the entire night. And so about halfway through the program, between songs, he said, George, can I say a word? And George said, yeah, go ahead. And he said, you know, today's my birthday. And everybody applauded, and he said, right before I walked out here on stage tonight, sweet little Lauren Talley, gave me a homemade birthday card, just blessed me. He said, I just want to say that I'm so glad that when I was a young boy, Jesus asked me to be Lord of his life, and I'm glad that he did. <laughs> well, if you remember, we used to have the piano on this side of the stage, and my back was always to the guy. So when I heard that, I thought, okay. <laughs> he didn't really say that. Because George, you know, he didn't react. He just, yeah, you know, I mean, he just did. And so we went right on with the program, and it was over. And so we got loaded up. We went to a truck stop. We went in and ate supper. Uh, ate hamburger, nobody said anything. We got back on the bus, we were riding down the road, George was up front laughing, we were all telling stories, just laughing like we always did. It's about two o'clock, everybody was in the bed. And uh, I got in my bunk, Mark was on the bottom bunk, and then George was in the middle, and my bunk was on the top. So I climbed up in my bunk, everybody was in bed, it was pitch dark in there, you couldn't see. And I'd been laying in the bunk about 10 minutes, I guess, rolling down the highway, and from underneath my bunk, I hear this voice, and he says, Hey, Gerald. I said, Yeah. He said, Are you still awake? <laughs> I said, Yeah, I'm awake. He said, In case I don't wake up in the morning, I just wanted to tell you that I'm so glad that when I was just a young boy, Jesus asked me to be Lord of his life. <laughs> George was just the master at, he never got in a hurry. No. He was the master at sitting back and thinking it through and waiting for the 
perfect opportunity to pounce. And he didn't do it because he was mean. No. He did it because he was a jokester. Oh he loved just he loved practical jokes. He loved to be funny. He was that way on stage and off stage. I'll never forget this happened to you, and this is probably going to be news to you. Ernie. <laughs> Your beloved father-in-law. So we had, we, I don't know where it was, we sang, and, and Ernie just killed, oh, what a savior. He just, it was, in, it was amazing. And people were standing and clapping and applauding, and it went on. And, and he did, man. I mean, he just, it was an amazing performance that night. And uh, it was just, it was just amazing. And the place just went crazy. And we stood there, and we stood there, and we stood there. And George went on and, and finished, the, finished the evening. And that night when we got on the bus, I saw George sitting back in the corner. I don't know where you were. You might have been up there. Maybe this isn't a newsflash. George started scratching his hand. He said, hey, Scott. Ernie thinks he's a star. <laughs> yeah. He don't know I made him a star. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> I just remember when I when I joined the group, uh, and about two or three months later. Yeah, I met Lisa, and um, as George always said, lightning flashed, and, and uh, fireworks went off. And uh, so about eight months later, we were going to get married. And, uh, and honestly, my car did have not only bald tires when I came up, but it had a leak in the roof. I had, used to hold a, a cloth up to, to keep the water from coming in when it would rain. And, and on my way up to, see the, to, to audition and sing for the cathedrals, um, it was a torrential downpour, and the wiper blades were going like this, and all of a sudden, it just came out of the, the arm just came off <laughs> and I'm driving up 71 with my head out the window soaking wet you know so it was just pitiful and uh, and so I didn't have enough money I didn't have enough money for a down payment on nothing and uh, so when we finally found a condo that we were gonna move into and after the wedding and all like that uh, I went to George and I said George I'll pay you back every dime but they're not gonna lend me this money he goes, you let me take care of this. And so we met at the bank, and of course the banker knew George, and, and he had his, I mean, he's always dressed to the nines anyways. And, uh, but he, he put on his suit and tie and walked in there at the banker, and we sat in front of that desk. And uh, he kind of showed him, and it wasn't that much, but he's just looking at it. And George had his glasses on his nose, and he's looking at it, and he goes, mm-hmm, sounds good, sounds good. And he goes, now, George, Mr. Yance, how long has this guy been employed with you? George's like, six months. He goes, you sure you want to co-sign a loan on somebody who's only been with you six months? And George was in the midst of writing his name. And he goes, he ain't going nowhere. <laughs> True story. And Ernie sold that old car to Scott. Scott still got it today. <laughs> Ernie, would you go with me to the bank? <laughs> Me up. I got to tell you this story. This, me up. this involved Danny, and I, I, I hope you remember. Have this. you noticed how we're not telling any stories on ourselves? We're oh, picking no. on everybody. <laughs> but this does involve Danny. We we used to work for a, a promoter. He was actually a church music guy, Jerry Evans, and he just passed away uh, earlier this year. Just a great guy. As a matter of fact, he's the guy who had the original idea. Uh, for the cathedrals to start making videos right. and and a lot of other groups I mean all these older videos you see on YouTube that were made at PTL in Charlotte that was Jerry Evans idea I mean he was just a, he was really a forward thinker and so we we worked for him a lot and uh, whenever we would sing in Mobile Alabama where he lived he would invite us over to his house for lunch and his uh, mother and uh, his mother-in-law was a great cook actually his mom was a great cook and so they would put on this big spread. And we went in there one day, and they would always have gumbo and that kind of stuff, you know, which I didn't care for. But uh, we had to, uh, Glenn required us to act like we liked it, you know, whether we did or not. So that's fine. As he used to say, just go in and stir a fork through it and act that's like right. you like it. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. right. But Glenn loved gumbo. Glenn loved it, and all, all these guys loved it. Well, that particular day, 
She had boiled, uh, she had boiled shrimp, she had cold boiled shrimp, which Danny loved cold boiled shrimp. So we were going through this little buffet line in the kitchen, and Danny just piling these shrimp on his plate, you know. Yeah. And so uh, Danny looked at Glenn, who was right beside him, and said, Glenn, you like boiled shrimp? Glenn said, yeah, I like boiled shrimp, I like boiled shrimp. He said, get you some. So Glenn got him some boiled shrimp, and we all went into the dining room and sat down around the table. And so uh, this was the appetizer. So we were all just. Uh, Are you going to tell him that Glenn had never eaten? He had never bowl, eaten bowl shrimp. shrimp. Okay. No, this is the first. So we're all sitting there, you know, uh, eating our shrimp and just enjoying it. And finally, somebody it was Danny looked across the table. I heard crunching. Yeah, and we all had our little plates in front of us for the shells, you know, where you peel the shell off. Yeah. And he looked across the table. And I heard Glenn crunching. Something yeah, was crunching. crunching. And Danny looked across the table and said, Glenn, didn't you get any of that? Didn't you get any shrimp? And Glenn said, oh, yeah, it was delicious. It was, it was great. Loved it. And he said, well, where are you putting the shells? And Glenn looked around and noticed that everybody else had a pile of shells, but he didn't. And he said, well, I eat them. Don't you know that's where all the nutrients are? LAUGHTER